good evening, everybody. Welcome to this um, EU IPFF webinar on comorbidities and progressive interstitial lung disease, or ILD. This is the second in a series of monthly webinars that we are holding leading up to the first European Pulmonary Fibrosis Patient Summit, um, which will be a virtual event in April of this year. My name is Steve Jones. I'm the president of EU IPFF, the European Pulmonary Fibrosis Federation, which comprises 21 patient organizations from 15 countries across Europe. I'm also the chair of the UK patient organization, Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis. As many of you know, <coughs> we plan to hold the European Pulmonary Fibrosis Summit in Poland in April 2020, but because of the COVID epidemic, we had to postpone, and we've decided now the best plan is to hold it virtually in April 2021. We were very disappointed to postpone because we had arranged a, a great program with lots of exciting speakers and lots of events for the Warsaw meeting. However, I'm pleased to say that we have one of those exciting speakers with us here tonight. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Kreuter, who is head of the ILD Expert Center in Heidelberg in Germany and is one of the leading global researchers on interstitial lung disease. Michael is active in the European Respiratory Society and is soon to become the secretary of the ERS ILD Assembly, which brings together most of the doctors in Europe interested in research on ILD. Michael believes strongly in involving patients in healthcare and research, and he is and always was a great supporter of EU IPFF. Some of you may have seen Michael at the 2019 ERS Congress in Madrid, in conversation on stage in front of many hundreds of people with my colleague Klaus Geisler, one of his IPF patients, discussing the PF, you know, the pulmonary fibrosis patient journey and how doctors and patients can work most effectively together. It's really a, not to be missed. I'm sure it's somewhere on YouTube if you, if you look for it. You may remember last time that we joked a little bit with Gisley Jenkins about his cycling prowess and how much money he was raising for action for pulmonary fibrosis. Well, I think in Michael Gisley has found his match in, in more ways than one. Um, Michael is an accomplished trumpet player um, and frequently gives concerts in support of patient organizations. I was gonna ask you to bring your trumpet tonight, Michael, but I thought maybe we probably wouldn't have enough time, but maybe on another occasion, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Michael is gonna split his talk tonight into two parts. He'll first talk for 15 minutes on the importance of comorbidities, and that will be across all forms of pulmonary fibrosis, including IPF. We'll follow that with 10 minutes of Q&A. He'll then talk for 15 more minutes about fibrotic ILD, or what we might call non-IPF progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So we're talking about you know, the um, types of disease like um, <clears throat> chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, or you know, farmer's lung type diseases, about connective tissue and autoimmune diseases. Um, we'll follow that with 20 minutes of Q&A, and we aim to finish tonight by 2015 Central European time or 1915 UK time. Um, could I have the next slide, Michael? Um, could I please ask you to submit any questions you'd like to ask using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I think most, many of you will know this from the last time we did it. Please use the Q&A function and not the chat function. When you submit your questions, be really glad if you could write complete questions and make them as succinct as possible. Because if you start entering in comments or random thoughts, it's gonna clog up the system and make it a bit more difficult to, to get to the, nut, the essence of the matter. If there are any other questions that we don't have time for tonight, Michael has kindly offered to provide written responses afterwards, and these will be available on our website. Um, I'm really pleased tonight that in addition to all of us here <coughs> listening to the webinar in English, the Greek patient organization, which is very active, has a translator um, on with us. Um, you can see her possibly on your screen as Merka Kapi. She will be doing simultaneous translation into Greek for um, people in Greece, which is great. So welcome very much to everybody from, from Athens and other parts of Greece. Um, as I say, the webinar will be recorded. It will be made available online on the EUIPFF website in English and within two weeks, 
in five other European languages with subtitles. So I think that's about it for now. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Kreuter and invite him to talk to us about the importance of comorbidities and progressive interstitial lung disease. Thanks, Michael. Over to you. Good ladies and gentlemen, first of all, a great pleasure, uh, well, not seeing but speaking to you at least tonight, and it was a great honor being invited uh, to be your guest, Steve, tonight, and especially thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Those of you who do not believe that uh, I play the trumpet, well, I could open my door and then you could hear my eldest son are uh, practicing his trombone currently, and if I would not be with you tonight, I would practice together with him. So yes, it's in the family. Uh, but if you're a little bit more interested in what are the effects of, uh, let's say, brass instruments on lung diseases, well, you could either follow one of my talks about that very interesting topics, or you could go to on the website of the Torx Clinic, that is the place where I'm working, because uh, about a year ago, we had our last charity concert and uh, Klaus and others were also guests there. And we had a marvelous concert uh, from a British uh, composer, uh, which was great together with a, a student's choir here in Germany. So I think music is very fantastic and fascinating. However, what is also fascinating, and I think especially for you as patients, very important to understand, is the role of so-called comorbidities, and then a little bit later on what progressive fibrosis in our interstitial lung disease means. What you can see here is my, uh, um, and what you can see here is the importance and the question what comorbidities are. So first of all, let me explain to you what a comorbid condition is. That means those of you, for instance, who are suffering from IPF, that means the question, is there any other comorbid condition which affects the patient? And as you can see here, these data come from the German registry, the so-called German Insights IPRF registry. And at that time, we had about 700 patients, and we asked those patients, what other kinds of diseases are you suffering from? And what you can see here is that out of about 600 patients, you see here that the huge majority of patients have whatever kind of different other diseases and that there is a minority of patients who do not suffer from any kind of comorbid conditions, less than 15%. Which means comorbid conditions, speaking again, others than interstitial lung disease are, are very prominent in our patients. However, there is one important our consideration, which you must not forget, and that is this, that IVF is a disease of the aging population. And you can see here Marlon Brando, one of the most uh, prominent patients with IVF uh, when he was old and when he was suffering from um, IVF at that time. And we do know, and this is data coming from COPD, however, this is translatable also to IPF. We do know that the older a human being gets, the more disorders are, are affecting him or her. What you can see here, this dotted lines mean this is the typical age when we detect IPF and our COPD. And you can see here, the older a patient gets, the more condition, other conditions, comorbid conditions, these patients are suffering from. And a very good example of this is this one here, is our arterial hypertension. On the left side here, you can see a meta-analysis from 2016 being published by Ganesh Raghu. What he did here is he acquired all available information on how frequent arterial hypertension in patients with IPF is. And you can see here, this is up to about 70%. And if you comprise all these data together, it's something between 50 to 70%. And this is looking here at data coming from Germany, very typical for the uh, people who are affected by IPF. This is an elderly population, something between 50 and 80 years old. And you can see here these data come from Germany that arterial hypertension in about 60 years old patients 
is about 60% and the 80 years old patient is about 80%. Perhaps there are some co-factors, for instance, people suffering from chronic lung, lung disorders are out of the side, which increases blood pressure. Sometimes they're using steroids, increasing blood pressure. Smokers or rec smokers and also so-called sleep apnea increase arterial hypertension. However, there's a little bit more in the relationship between aging and lung diseases, aging and comorbid conditions in IPF. And that is emphysema, smoker's lung, and IPF. And you can see here that is a typical finding in the patient suffering from a fibrotic lung disease. And you can see fibrosis here or here. And this here, these are the remnants of smoking. This is what we call emphysema. And we do know that there is some genetic changes, which we call telomeres. And the older you get, the more shortening of these telomeres you have. And we do know that in diseases where we have a earlier aging than in other patients or people, we do know that this telomere shortening is associated with some cofactors. And the typical cofactor is smoking. And smoking may affect so-called precursor cells, which means on one hand so-called mesenchymal cells, that is cells we find in the lung parenchyma, and then that may lead to emphysema, that is this one here, that is the smoker's lung, or it can also affect epithelial cells and then leading to fibrosis. So there is one link with aging and comorbid conditions here in emphysema. However, there's a little bit more than aging. And a little bit more than aging is the question, is there some form of a comorbid condition of an other disease which may lead or even aggravate our lung fibrosis? And that might be diabetes. From a German our analysis, we learned that in patients who suffer from diabetes, the more diabetic they are, the more dyspneic they are outside of having cardiac disease. And also, this is this data here, it shows that if you look at a patient with diabetes and you perform a lung function, then you see that these people may have a restrictive lung disease, which means if you perform a lung function, the volume curve is shrinking. That is what you also see in patients with lung fibrosis. And there is some older data you can see here from Hunt and colleagues and the Enomoto and colleagues, that is data coming from Japan here, looking at risk factors for the development of IPF. And what this Japanese group has found out is that diabetes mellitus is associated with the development of IPF, which means, and we think that hyperglycemia means more blood sugar may affect the clearance of bacteria in the lung and perhaps also may induce fibrotic scarring in the lung so that we may have a link between a comorbid condition, diabetes and the development of IPF or other fibrotic lung diseases. However, there's a little bit more. And this is, sounds very, very simple, but it is, I think, very complex. That is, how much does IPF or other fibrotic lung diseases affect quality of life? And if you suffer from more than that condition, does this even aggravate your loss of quality of life? And that is something we looked into again in the German Institute IPF registry. We compared patients without any comorbid conditions outside of IPF to, for instance, patients having more or equal to four comorbid conditions. And what you can see here is, so that is quality of life as measured with the so-called St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. And the higher the bar, the less the quality of life is. And if you see here an increase, that means that there is a worse quality of life. And if you see here without any and with equal to or more than four comorbid conditions, you can see here, this heavily affects quality of life. But this is not the only important finding. The other very important finding is this one here. That is, if you have the same IPF patient without any comorbid condition, 
this is this one here, and you compare that IPF patient to a patient who has several comorbid conditions, that also affects outcomes. And you can see here, having no comorbid conditions and more than four comorbid conditions, there is a separation of, the, of these lines, and this is survival lines, which means we have to look at comorbid conditions with regards to quality of life, but also with regards to outcomes. And there's one very important um, comorbid condition, and that is lung cancer. And there's several observations coming from Asia, especially from Japan, but also from Europe. And you can see here European data, which shows us that over the time, a patient with IPF, and this is a lot of smokers, ex-smokers, ex-male smokers, and they develop lung cancer, but also in patients who never smoked. And we think that there's a link between the development of lung cancer and IPF. And especially when once these two diseases come together, then it is very complicated because it affects your survival and it affects your quality of life. And especially the treatments we are choosing may affect the treatments we are choosing against lung cancer may also affect IPF because we may induce some worsening. And this worsening is, for instance, called acute exacerbation. So if we perform surgery on lung cancer in an IPF patient, then perhaps we may see an acute exacerbation. And that is one of the most detrimental linkages we can see in comorbid conditions. However, there's other diseases. And one of these other diseases is so-called reflux disease, meaning your heartburn. And there is some discussion about that if you have some so-called micro aspirations of gastric or, or your swelling and gastric compounds, which are acidic, that might perhaps aggravate or even induce inflammation in the lung that may lead to the development or aggravation of lung. However, what was observed is a little bit controversy. That is what you can see here. So you can see here that is again survival curves. That is the absence of the diagnosis of our symptomatic reflux disease. And that is the presence in one and here in another cohort, you can see here very similarly that when patients have reflux disease, they have a better outcome. So why is that? And that is a, a very long standing discussion, which is still ongoing. And uh, that is about the medical treatment with so-called anti-acid therapy, which you may know with the name of proton pump inhibitors. And there was a uh, postdoc analysis of data coming from the, ins, uh, from the IPF net in the United States. And they looked into their trials and looked into the so-called placebo cohorts, meaning the patients didn't receive an intervention. And they compared patients who received PPI and patients not receiving PPI. And you can see here that there's a little bit more stabilization with those having, uh, compared to those not having PPI. However, there is other data, data coming from controlled clinical trials, again, a post-hoc analysis, meaning that was not a clinical trial comparing PPI to no PPI. That was a, a trial, for instance, in this one here, comparing pifenidum to placebo. And we looked here into the placebo arm and looked to those patients who have anti-acid therapy, PPI, where there's not having, we don't see any outcomes. And that is a matter of debate. So we do know that reflex disease has some link with the development of IPF. We see perhaps a better outcome. It may be associated with a therapy of reflex disease, but currently we don't know whether this is true, yes or no. And what we may need for this is a clinical trial investigating the use of proton pump inhibitors. There's other diseases, and this is very frequent disease that is so-called coronary artery disease. Well, what we do know is that our patients with COPD are more than 90% smokers. And we do know that our patients with COPD, with smokers lung, that these patients have a very high risk of developing significant coronary artery disease. Stephen Nathan from the US compared patients with IPF on one hand and COPD on the other hand and looked into who may develop more coronary artery disease and everybody would have thought because the people who are smokers or ex-smokers in COPD is very high. 
So we thought that it is more frequent in COPD. However, what he showed was that it is even higher in IPF. And there was an extremely lower frequency of smokers or red smokers. And what he also showed is this one here, that our coronary artery disease is also affecting quality of life and outcomes in patients with IPF, meaning that coronary artery disease is also a very important comorbid condition in patients with IPF. And again, looking into drugs, which is, I think, very important, there was an observation that if you look into patients who have a very heavy smoking history, and that is more or less something we call a registry called COPD gene. And the colleagues here analyzed for different forms of drugs and whether these drugs affect the lung. And what they found out is they didn't look at COPD in this analysis. They looked at the development of fibrosis in the lungs. What they found out is that with one drug you are using very frequently to treat at least some outcomes in coronary artery disease, the so-called statins, they described that once you're taking statins, then perhaps you may develop lung fibrosis. However, another investigation looked again into placebo arms of clinical prospective trials and found out, that is this data here, that at least with statins, there's a trend to better survival and to less problems associated with IPF. So on one hand, perhaps drugs may induce or activate, or on the other hand, may also have a positive outcome or effects on IPF. And one of the very typical uh, ex, uh, exemplations is uh, statins. And with regards to comorbid conditions, and this was also a very short view on what comorbid conditions may mean in IPF, is this summary here. That is what we call a comorbidome. What does this mean? You see here several dots. And the bigger the dot, the more frequent this comorbid condition is. And you see here this dotted line and comorbid conditions which are within these lines are associated with death in a patient with IPF. So coming back, for instance, here to here, looking at the outcome of a patient with IPF to lung cancer, you see here, that is the closest relationship as shown a little bit earlier. But what I would like to highlight is more this one here. If you compare a patient, and that is data coming from our, a, a German um, healthcare institute, um, and we looked into data of a, a German healthcare institution, and we compared patients, for instance, suffering from COPD, the patients are, uh, who are uh, in patients who are not treated to patients who are treated. And you can see here that perhaps patients who have COPD and are treated for their disease COPD compared to those not treated for COPD, that those treated for the comorbid condition may have a better outcome. And that brings me to the last point with regards to comorbid conditions. And that is a slide we brought up a couple of years ago together from Marquis Weisenbeck on how to care for patients with interstitial lung disease, the so-called ABCDE. And the ABCDE, the C here, also stands for comorbid conditions, looking at very important comorbid conditions. One, for instance, I didn't speak about is obstructive sleep apnea, where we do know that treatment of obstructive sleep apnea may affect your outcome positively in IPF with regards to outcome, but also with regards to quality of life. So looking at comorbid conditions and treating these comorbid conditions as one would do in a non-IPF affected uh, patient, uh, this is a, a very, very important points of care in IOD. And with this, I think we should start discussing this first topic before we go to another very important but very different topic, speaking about comorbid conditions. And if you are having questions, uh, then please put these yeah, in. Great, I'll the... take over, Michael. That's great. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a, a great start to the, the evening. And um, we've got a couple of questions already come in. One is um, a couple of the Greek participants have noticed that some of their older colleagues with um, IPF have recently been vaccinated for COVID, 
and some of them have since died, um, possibly some doctors claiming it was the result of comorbidities associated with vaccination and everything. Is that something, I've not heard of that, is that at all something that is of concern? Well, this is a very important but currently unsolvable question. So I think the uh, most important observation which has been made in this regard comes from Norway. And uh, there was some vaccination in elderly people's home and some of these people died after vaccination. And many of these patients were very old and very comorbid. Uh, yes, vaccination may be associated with side effects, but uh, I have seen several patients with COVID. COVID is much more worse. So perhaps, yes, there may be side effects, but if comorbid conditions really affect side effects or even lead to our, let's say, morbidity or mortality after the vaccination, IPF or comorbid conditions is unsolved. But to be honest, I don't think so. And especially our, a corona con infection in people like you, I think is much more dangerous than the vaccination. Great, thanks. And um, that's a really important point, that balance of risks, isn't it? Um, a point one person didn't quite get the point you, you made <coughs> about the impact of protein pump inhibitor treatment on exacerbation of and pulmonary fibrosis and asked if you could clarify that. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated. I, I, I yeah, know it's clarify often simply. complicated. <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to clarify that simply. So. Our comorbid conditions are on effect on patients with IPF. What we have noticed is that patients with reflux disease, and reflux disease means you have symptoms, but these patients have a better outcome. So there are several uh, thoughts about this. One is, if you have reflux, that leads to cough. And cough, you go to your GP, and he, that patient, uh, that uh, GP sends you to the pulmonologist, and then you have a workup. And perhaps if you have reflux and you are coughing and you are sent earlier to the pulmonologist, then perhaps IPF might be diagnosed earlier, which means that may explain why patients who have reflux disease symptoms associated with reflux have a better outcome. I hope that is clear. Another possibility is okay. that if we have reflux and reflux may induce or accurate IPF, meaning you have gastric compounds, and these are acidic, and you have so-called microaspirations, meaning um, uh, while you're sleeping, you're lying like this, and then you have a little bit of amount of, let's say a milliliter or even less of gastric compounds, you're swelling and then aspirating into your lung. Mm -hmm. And that may lead to some form of an inflammation because this is acid. Just remember, if you put acid on your skin, what that makes, it makes an inflammation. And that same may happen in your lung. So if you consider to treat a acidic compound, you may see less inflammation in the lung, which means that was more or less the initial idea of using PPI or investigating proton pump inhibitors because they decrease the acidic compound and the gastric content which may then perhaps be a treatment against IPF. And there is several investigations. The first one coming from Joycelyn Lee and from Ganesh Regu, looking into patients with IPF were part of a clinical trial. And in the placebo arm, meaning this as the patients who don't get the intervention. Mm. These patients, they were analyzed for, they are having proton pop inhibitors versus not having but not for the indication of IPF, but for the indication of whatever. For instance, having a lot of drugs, having steroids, or having reflux disease. And what they found out is that patients who had proton pump inhibitors had a better survival than the others, or had less lung function decrease. Mm -hmm. However, there's other data coming from postdoc analyses of the perfenidin trials, and later on also from others, see, uh, where we demonstrated that these effects could not be shown again. So PPI might be a treatment because we may decrease the acidic compound of microaspiration, but perhaps it is not. And that is something which is currently unclear. So hopefully that clarifies. Great. No, thank you for that. And there is a, a study just started at the University of East Anglia um, across 40 hospitals in the UK, looking again at the question of whether 
taking a protein pump inhibitor will actually slow down progression of IPF. So there's, I mean, we, we don't have a very, yeah, we don't have a definitive answer at the moment, do we really? Yeah. Okay. No, we, we don't, and that is why we need these kinds of trials. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. A question from, um, uh, on perfenidone. Um, and the worry about vaccination again. I think inevitably there's going to be a lot of questions on vaccination. Yeah, um, sure. tonight. Um, and the question, if you've shown a reaction to perfenidone in the past, I heard of a friend of mine today who did, should would they inform the doctor before vaccination? So uh, reaction against perfenidone does mean what, a allergic reaction? Well, one, one colleague I know of did have an allergic reaction. Okay. Um, and I think they decided, he thinks they probably decided not to give him the Pfizer vaccine. Okay. But um, I just, what your view would be on that? Well, what we, what we do know is that once you're allergic in general, then you may have more allergic reactions against whatever drug. However, we do know that there's a difference between different drugs. So, for instance, pifedalin is a drug where there's at least a kind of a increased a risk of a allergic drug reaction. However, I think that this, and it's not easy to answer, I think this is our uh, um, overestimating the allergic drug reaction against the vaccination. Uh, so there might be some risk. So perhaps you may be a little bit less worried if you wait for another drug. However, the allergic drug reaction against the uh, Pfizer BioNTech um vaccination i think is quite uh low and again um well i i got my two shots already because we are very exposed in our hospital and yes there are side effects but to be honest i have seen many COVID patients and also patients with ipf or other fibrotic lung disease and COVID. and to be honest i would not dare not to get any vaccination i would for the vaccination because you're observed 30 minutes after that whether you develop an allergic reaction, yes or no. And, and even if you do, then uh, you will not uh, receive the second vaccination. So I would still go for a vaccination, even if I have seen allergic drug reaction against the phenomenon. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you, Michael. And uh, uh, another question about um, uh, patients saying that they're surprised to see osteoporosis mentioned as a comorbidity. And they're asking if this condition can influence treatment in IPF. Is there, what's the relationship with IPF? And now, This is a very good point. So we don't have many data on that. We published our, some data as an abstract, meaning we presented data uh, uh, at a um, scientific conference at the ERS conference two years ago. So what we do see is that in patients with uh, interstitial lung disease in general, they have more osteoporosis than patients without and one of the reasons might be the association between former steroid treatment, because we do know that steroids may affect osteoporosis. But there's a little bit more than that, perhaps. So because we are doing, we are seeing this also in IPF, a disease which at least since about eight years is not treated with steroids anymore. And it is currently unclear why, but we think that is a kind of a relationship between different diseases like diabetes and so on. Where you have a lot of hormones affected and also osteoporosis is a kind of a metabolic disease so perhaps there's some linkage what that means is still unclear and uh, yes what we should do is we should screen our patient for osteoporosis however most of you receive at least at their uh, first diagnosis and perhaps then annually or every second year or whatever a thoracic CT, and then you can look at the spine and then you can see whether there's osteoporosis present, yes or no. Great, okay. One, one other question um, before we move on, and there's, uh, there are one or two others that we'll keep for later as well. You mentioned that diabetes is associated with IPF, and you, you hypothesized about increasing blood sugar and the impact that has. Um, it's interesting that that's also associated with COVID, with COVID-19 and the process of um, you know, damage to the lungs in COVID. Are these two things related? This is a very good question. Uh, this is an open question. I, this is currently investigated. Um, I think there might be a linkage uh, because once you have diabetes, then your immune system is not working properly. 
which means your local immune system in the lungs, which may then accurate or induce pulmonary fibrosis. And on the other hand, perhaps may make your lung more prone to develop fibrosis uh, once you are affected by COVID. So perhaps, yes, there is a link, but still unclear why. Great. Okay. Well, let's move on then, Michael, to the second part of your talk. And then I'll save the other couple of questions here sure, until great. later. If I could just ask somebody, um, Michael Lyon sent a question in on um, comorbidities treating cancer. Michael, could you, would you mind sending that question again clearly? Because I don't quite understand what it is you're asking. Great. So over to you, Michael. Thank you. So another important point I would like to view, and I think that would uh, be perhaps a, a, a future talk for a whole evening is what we call progressive fibrosis in fibrosing interstitial lung disease. So what this means, I hope to clarify within the next 15 minutes. That comes from an observation like this one here. So that is looking at a patient with IPF. And this here is the onset of symptoms in the patient with IPF. And you do know that we have a very heterogeneous course of disease, but we do know that in these patients, we have a constant uh, progression of their fibrotic scarring. And we do know that IPF is associated with a detrimental outcome, but there's other diseases where we have very comparable data. And these diseases, fibrotic lung diseases, are, for instance, systemic sclerosis affecting the lungs, rheumatoid arthritis affecting the lungs, or, for instance, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So let me give you uh, one example, that is systemic sclerosis. That is not a, a disease limited to the lungs. It's a disease where almost every organ can have a kind of a fibrosis. And what we have seen in the 70s is that the patients were man, mainly compromised by renal failure. And uh, once the rheumatologist detected what, are the, what is the underlying path of, uh, physiology behind that, they avoided, for instance, drugs like steroid or used our ACE inhibitors. And once they were able to uh, identify and treat the severe complication, then other complications, organ complications, popped up. For instance, this one here, that is pulmonary hypertension. However, then currently we have for patients affected by systemic sclerosis, now we have early diagnosis and early treatment with drugs. And once this was achieved, then we have this one here, and that is what patients with systemic lung affecting, that is interstitial lung disease, that is fibrotic scarring of the lung. And we do know that it is very clearly associated with a progression, with a progression of systemic sclerosis in general, especially progression of fibrotic scarring in the lung and also with outcomes. Very comparable, another disease, rheumatoid arthritis, then uh, Danish data showing us that once you're a, have, uh, you're a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and you are not having a pulmonary complication, may, uh, uh, mainly ILD, compared to patients with rheumatoid arthritis where ILD is present, then you can see here that mortality rates are almost doubled once you're affected by ILD. And the question is, and that question came up about 10 years ago, if you're a patient with a lung fibrosis, may fibrosis behave very similar. And what you can see here, that is what we call the so-called UIP pattern. And some of you may have heard that. UIP pattern means scarring of the lung. And you can see typical features, for instance, these so-called honeycomb changes, which is a prominent feature of UIP pattern. But UIP pattern in general is not a disease. It is a pattern. And you can find it in IPF, but you can also find it, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis ILD. You can find it in asbestos associated and related interstitial lung disease, or for instance, in fibrosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And the question is whether this may lead to what you have seen here, to uh, the detrimental outcomes associated with lung fibrosis in non-IPF, but other ILD patients. And in order to understand that better, I brought a patient of mine to you. So that patient was suffering from some dyspnea uh, since six months. However, he was not affected by cough. The patient had no exposures. 
However, looking at his comorbid condition, he was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis a year ago, and he has received some treatment with methotrexate and steroids. And what you can see here is the so-called baseline lung fraction. And I think most of you know what vital capacity is. It more or less shows you how large your lung is, how much air can go into your lung. And also diffusion capacity was significantly impaired. That means how much oxygen your lung can take up. And what you can see here is his CT. You see here, this is the heart. And this here, for instance, is bone. This is the spine. And everything which is black is air. And this black here is air in the left and here in the right lung. What you can see here is these things here, uh, this one here, these white things within the black holes. That is fibrosis, that is scarring in the lung. So that patient, because he had fibrosis and that patient had rheumatoid arthritis, is by definition a rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease. And at that time, we initiated some form of a new modulatory drug treatment. And that patient was followed up after uh, 12 months. And you can see here lung function at baseline, lung function after a year, diffusion capacity at baseline, diffusion capacity after a year that is stable. However, that patient then developed our, some more fear. And we performed a new lung function and a new HRCT. And what you can see here, initial lung function and follow-up lung function, the patient lost 5% of vital capacity. And I, th I think what you can especially see here is this one here. So that is the initial CT, that is the follow-up CT. And you see here, these white lines compared to these lines here, that is an increase of fibrotic scarring on lung CT. And that is what we call, and the disease behavior is very similar to IPF, a progressive pulmonary fibrosis, for instance, here in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And we can find this phenotype or this subtype in several IV types. And the, uh, these subtypes will be more or less found in all patients with IPF. You also can find it in so called idiopathic NSIP, also in hypersensitivity pneumonitis or in systemic diseases, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis or systemic sclerosis, ILD, and also in so-called pneumoconiosis and asbestos-associated uh, interstitial lung disease. When do we speak about a progressive fibrosis? Well, this is currently uh, under debate and an international guideline, perhaps in future, but uh, we came up with a, at least our suggested definition currently and why we came up with this, uh, we speak about this a little bit later. So we look at the development of lung function over two years, meaning a decline in lung function or the combination of a decline in lung function and decline in diffusion capacity, or the combination with a increased fibrosis on HRCT, or in the combination with progressive symptoms, or the combination of having more symptoms and having more fibrotic scarring on HRCT. So that is where we are speaking currently about our, a progressive fibrotic phenotype in patients with ILD outside of IPF. So what do we know about these patients? Not that much currently. However, this is data very recently published by Professor Vincent Cortin's group. And he looked into several factors. And what I would like to highlight is this one here. That means that if you're a patient with this FILD phenotype, then you have a higher chance of having a uh, more severe course of the disease if you, for instance, have a so-called unclassifiable or a fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or and or if you have a lower lung function at baseline, have more decline of lung function over the time, and if you're older. And the main question is, how can we stop that fibrotic scarring? And this here is data uh, from a survey we performed about two years ago. And we asked physicians, pulmonologists, 
and also here rheumatologist how do you treat these patients who have a progression despite other treatments and i brought you that slide because what you can see here is there's a lot of colors and that means once you see a lot of colors that nobody really has a clue what to do so we're starting here for instance with connective tissue disease associated with iod and once you are diagnosed with a connective tissue disease associated with iod are uh, you asked together with your patient the question is this clinically significant and then you initiate immune suppressive therapy and that is what you can see here but if you have an aggravation of fibrosis then you have to consider this one here because we do know a disease where we have a progressive scarring a progressive fibrotic phenotype and that is IPF and in this one here we have a treatment we call anti-fibrotic therapy however again Immune suppression is, was only available here. And uh, Ariel Fisher, who was a rheum or is a rheumatologist, together with Ron Duba, who was a pulmonologist at the Royal Popkins and in Denver some years ago, they asked themselves the question: if you have a lung fibrosis, even in an other disease as IPF, and that disease behaves like IPF, shouldn't we consider to treat that as an IPF? And that is what we call a clinical trial in PFILD. And there is currently three trials published and we'll show you results of two of them. The first one is the so-called INVIL trial and they investigated Nintendanib, a drug to, uh, patients with IPF amongst you may know over a year and giving them either the drug or a placebo and uh, they will show what kind of diseases were investigated and there was another study, the so-called relief trial, which was uh, uh, performed in Germany by the German Center for Lung Research, again, over about a year. However, we have to prematurely uh, stop that because uh, of several problems associated with that. And then finally, there was another trial looking only at unclassifiable uh, patients over half a year. And the patients who were included into these trials were, and you can see here these dots is the uh, inbuilt, and this blue dots is the German relief study, and the yellow dots is the UID study. So in the unclassifiable study, it was more or less only unclassifiable. In the inbuilt study that included these patients, but also the patients with NSP, systemic uh, disease associated ILD, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and very uh, co much comparable with the German relief study. So very broad in inbuilt and a little bit less broad, but still very broad in the German relief study. Now that here is the outcomes we found in the inbuilt study. So I would like to explain these data to you. So that is patients in the overall population, meaning all the different diseases which have been included with hypersensitivity pneumonitis or systemic disease associated ILD and so on. You can see here over here the course of lung function in those who received contendinib compared to receiving placebo. And what you can see here is that there was a more severe lung functional decline in the placebo cohort compared to patients on an intendinib. And this is very much in line with the data we have seen in the so-called inbuilt study that were the studies leading to the removal of uh, an intendant of an IPF. So our patients with placebo uh, lost about 200 mils. And you can see here, this is very consistent with this study. And uh, in the intendant arm, it was in the IPF study about 100 mils. And you can see here, this is very much consistent with about 80 to 100 mils. So you see here, there's less decline in the patients who receive the antifibrotic drug. And also we have seen this one here, and I think this is very important. One very important complication in patients with fibrotic lung disease is so-called acute exacerbation, which means this is a very rapid onset of an aggravation of the disease. And we know from IPF that the internet may reduce uh, the number or at least the time to the first acute exacerbation. And that is also something they showed here in the inbuilt study in internet patients compared to placebo. Here in the intended patients, we had a uh, positive effect on the first time of acute exacerbation. 
And this is very much consistent with a German relief study that was a little bit complicated. So I will try to make it a little bit more easier. Just look at these data. So this is over 48 weeks with those patients who have been included, those patients receiving profanadon compared to patients with placebo. But you can see here, there is a clear difference comparable to here for those patients with profanadon have less functional decline compared to those receiving placebo, which means that antifibrotic treatment in a patient who has not IPF, but whose pulmonary fibrosis behaves like IPF a antifibrotic therapy might be a good choice. However, there's a lot of caveats which I would like to discuss with you as a final end. So this year is ladies and gentlemen, I have seen over the last years in my uh, ILD center. And all these patients had very similar symptoms. They have an exploration of, of our dyspnea on exertion. So this lady here, and you can see here where the initial lung functional values had after one and a half years, a significant decline of 10% with regards to vital capacity. And then we looked at the computed tomography at the HRCT. And I think you all know are very professional in reading CTs. You can see here more fibrotic scarring after one and a half years compared to the initial CT. But we have to be very that gentleman here had an initial uh, vital capacity of 61%. Then that gentleman developed more symptoms. And you see here, after two years, he had a significant decline in lung function from 61% to 50%. So he lost even more than uh, 10%. However, that was a patient looking at uh, the CT where we didn't see a exploration of fibrotic scarring, but we have seen more ground class opacities. And the patient was suffering from a fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and the alveolitic component, the more inflammatory component, was worsening. Because that patient was a bird breeder, and he had again contact to birds, and that lead, led to the development of the more or less uter inflammation, which means we have to look at, for instance, what are other factors causing more dyspnea? Is it the fibrotic scarring? Then yes, it is antifibrotic therapy, or is it other factors like in that patient? Again, he was exposed to what are, was the initiator of his lung fibrosis, of his interstitial lung disease, and then we took off the birds again, and then the patient improved. And the last patient uh, was a lady suffering from systemic sclerosis. And that patient also had an exploration of symptoms. And even looking at lung function values, you see uh, there was a uh, significant decline. However, when once we performed our HRCT, and here you see that is, for instance, the left lung uh, at the very, very basal part, you can see here in the very basal parts that is almost equal. There is no aggravation. And where does this aggravation come from? In a patient with systemic sclerosis, we are, we are finding a very high rate of pulmonary hypertension, and that was prominent in that patient. So that patient had not uh, a disease which could be treated with an antifibrotic drug, but that patient then received drugs against pulmonary arterial hypertension. So progressive fibrosing ILD is not a disease. It's a phenotype, it's a subtype in different fibrotic ILDs. And there's a couple of open questions. We do know that antifibrotic therapy helps. However, treatment algorithms have still to be uh, established and especially we need an internationally accepted definition for this. And with this, I hope that I have clarified a little bit more what PF ILD means and if and when antifibrotic therapy might be helpful. Oh, this, thank you very much. Looking forward to the next round of questions. Steve. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, going on, we have a number of interesting questions coming up. One, just to start with, so just to get for everybody to understand what phenotype means. I guess it means, is it the way in which a disease behaves? So these different diseases, RAILD, um, behave in a certain way and are all of them experienced by patients in a very similar way? They all involve increasing breathlessness. They all may involve cough. Um, 
fatigue and eventually dependence on oxygen. You know, the, the pathway is similar, yeah? Would that be a fair definition yeah. of phenotype? But with yeah. the phenotype, we mean, but still we are waiting for a better definition than phenotype. You can also say subtype. So let's, for instance, go back again to rheumatoid arthritis ILE. So if you look at 100 people with rheumatoid arthritis ILE, and they all have robotic scarring, and perhaps they may look with a CT very similar to IPF. From these 100 people, about 40 have a progressive fibrotic scarring, that is the PF ILE phenotype, and 60 of these pet people uh, never have a aggravation of their fibrosis, which means those 40 people have the subtype of a progressive fibrosis or a phenotype of progressive fibrosis. The differences are not clear yet. We are investigating factors for that, and we think that there may, may be some genetic background on this. Okay, that's very helpful. And there is a study um, coming out, I think, in a few, a couple of months' time in the European Respiratory Journal, which some people in the UK have done, looking at the number of people who have a fibrotic ILD defined in the way you did with those, um, the inbuilt criteria. They reckon that the, for every 10 IPF patients, um, possibly four to five patients have other kinds of progressive fibrosing ILD, the RA ILD and things. So it's often easy. I mean, we, a lot of us on the call, I imagine, have um, IPF. Um, but, you know, we have brothers and sisters who tend to have these other diseases. So of every 10 of us with IPF, there's four or five with the other ones. And the difference is, whereas IPF tends to be, as I understand it, largely a disease of older white men, um, the population of people with the other diseases tends to be younger. You know, they get diagnosed, I believe, when they're 40 to 60 years old, um, and you get a, a greater ethnic and other diversity. And indeed, I think women are slightly more than men in that group. So, you know, there's these interesting differences, and yet we are all behaving, our disease is behaving in a similar way. Yes, it's correct. So this is, I think, a very nice summary of the main differences. So first we started to learn about IPF, what it means, who is being affected, and now we are learning that diseases who, who may have a IPF similar course of disease, maybe for instance systemic cirrhosis, might be women, might be young people. So even there it is extremely important to recognize these people and then to treat these people and to stop the robotic scarring. Great. There's an interesting question come one gentleman here did <coughs> did the non-IPF patients in the inbuilt trial continue to receive their other medications? Thank you very much. So MTX. just just to avoid confusion, <coughs> I, I can speak about this, but I think this is very important. So are uh, some drugs were forbidden, other drugs were possible, uh, and there's an analysis of this uh, which I think is currently under review means. It is uh, submitted to a journal and their reviewers, other colleagues are looking at these data. So we don't not exactly know what are the outcomes with those who are having other immunomodulatory drugs or only antifibrotic drugs. But yes, some immunomodulatory drugs were allowed. Why? So again, looking at rheumatoid arthritis or systemic cirrhosis associated ILD, that is inflammatory systemic diseases, and there might be other besides the lung other organ complications, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis of the joints, so you perhaps need methotrexate or other drugs uh, so that you don't have problems there. So that is why it was allowed. Yeah, that does. I mean, there was another question asked about whether there's any truth in the connection between long-term use of methotrexate causing lung scarring. Thank What's you very the... much. A very <coughs> important point. So uh, when I was at medical school, uh, I learned that there's a couple of drugs which uh, may uh, induced lung diseases, and the one everybody recognizes is methotrexate. Mm -hmm. So a very long time we as pulmonologists thought that methotrexate is a kind of an evil, or uh, sorry, is a kind of a devil to the lungs. I will now we are learning that uh, methotrexate might even be a good lung, if you're uh, a good drug, if you're suffering from a lung disease, especially if you're suffering from lung fibrosis. And when we are now having more and more data showing that methotrexate might also be a treatment against fibrotic lung disease, or at least that the rate of problems associated uh, with interstitial lung disease is due to methotrexate is 
extremely less than the problem with uh, rheumatoid arthritis ILD and that perhaps um, methotrexate can help there. Great. There's another question which I'll just summarize. I mean, we're moving a little bit back into the comorbidities and mixing up the two, two parts of your talk. Um, uh, somebody asks from Greece about uh, the terrible, you know, the unstoppable cough that one gets with IPF in the, in, well, some people, when I had IPF before my transplant, I had it throughout my eight years, uh, a very bad cough, but it becomes particularly bad in the, in the final few years. Um, and um, the suggestion is what medicines are available that would help to soothe that. Now, I know we don't have a, you know, a good ones or specific ones, but what, what's your, your view on that? Well, a, a couple of, uh, of answers to that. So first of all, you have to investigate where the cough comes from. Is it coming from the fibrosis or is it coming from other factors? We have discussed it. one factor already that is reflex disease. So that is why uh, many of us uh, do a trial on PPI to decrease cough and that works in about a third of our patients. Second is there's other drugs like so-called ACE inhibitors, which are used to treat arterial hypertension or coronary artery disease. And we do know that that also are, may induce cough. So if you have an ACE inhibitor and you have cough, then perhaps speak to your pulmonologist or a GP that you at least try to stop it. And there's a couple of other explanations. And then, which is more prominent in patients with fibrotic lung disease, you have cough associated with your lung fibrosis. And you can do a couple of things. So one of the uh, kind of effective treatments is low-dose steroids, meaning about five milligrams or so. That might be helpful in a couple of patients. Then we have the typical cough suppressants, which at least helps in some patients. And then what we have seen, and there's a, a little bit of literature on that, for instance, Marley Weisenberg published that on, uh, on perfenidone. So what she did is, was a small trial looking on the effects of perfenidone of, uh, on cuff in IPF, and she has seen that there is a, a meaningful difference in those mm -hmm. taking perfenidone because it decreases cuff. And moreover, there's a couple of new clinical trials are uh, more or less uh, going to start very soon, and one has just been uh, finalized, and that to try new compounds or old compounds, however, in a new formulation have been used to treat our uh, cuff in IPF or other fibrotic lung diseases. So there is not there much, but uh, the mm. drug choices are increasing. And perhaps the last word on that. So many have phlegm, so they have sputum, they have mucus. So there, for instance, inhalation with sodium chloride might be helpful. Yeah. And there are other drugs like mu mucoloids and carbocysteine and such. Mm. That would to help be honest, um, I'm, not a big, I'm not a very big fan of that. Or uh, to be honest, I have seen uh, vice versa that these patients have more mucus and that these patients have an accuration of cuff. So at least in my patients, I'm not recommending these kinds of drugs. Great, thank you. And to what extent do you think the IPF cough is actually a sort of neuropathological cough? You know, it's caused by stresses on the nerves, um, maybe because of the fibrosis pulling the lung apart a bit, that that causes pressures that affect the nerve. Is, is that a, a line of inquiry? Or? Well, I think this is a couple of things. It is on one hand what you just uh, has been discussed. The other point is again speaking about reflux. So when you are suffering from fibrosis, you have a change of the pressure, the intrathoracic pressure, which then opens up our your lower esophagus sphincter, and then you have again microaspiration of gastric acidic gastric compound, which may then induce our cup. And then you have a third point. So our fibrosis in the lungs is something your lung recognizes that it doesn't belong to your body. And it's like a foreign body. So it wants to expectorate it. And that is why you have cuff, because it wants to get rid of the scarring of the lungs. However, that is not possible because the scarring is in your lungs. And that is a third important point. And that is why the presence of the uh, nerves, these cuff sens sensitations, is helpful in these patients, or might be helpful at least. Right. No, thank you. Sir. Going back to the comorbidities question, we've had a question asking whether the drugs that we currently have for IPF, I, I guess they mean perfenidone 
and intetinib, do they in any way contribute to the development of some of the comorbidities you were talking about? I mean, is oh, it possible? Oh, very good question. Yeah. Um, That's another one from Greece. Yeah. <laughs> hey, cool question. Um, uh, we don't have data on that. What we do know, uh, for instance, for Nintendo, Lab, we do know that are in the so so perhaps I have to explain how Nintendo Lab works. So uh, as a as a young physician, I did some research on so-called angiogenesis, and angiogenesis means the development of new blood vessels in your body. You can have that in a tumor, in a cancer. You can also have that in your heart after, for instance or a heart attack or when you have coronary artery disease. In some of the instances, angiogenesis, the building of new vessels is important. In others, it's detrimental. So in cancer, the more vessels the cancer has, the better the cancer can grow. And in coronary artery disease, if you have new vessels, then perhaps the muscle heart may uh, receive more oxygen. If you then give a drug like Nintendo Nip, which suppresses the building of new vessels, then perhaps you're decreasing the amount of new vessels and perhaps you're decreasing oxygen uptake in the heart. This is hypothes hypothetically. So that is one of the points which was investigated, whether you have more heart attacks or more other uh, problems associated with these kinds of coronary artery disease or similar um, comorbid conditions in patients with IPF treated with an antendonib. But still, we haven't seen a significant meaningful difference there. But that is at least something you have to be aware of. Right. However, uh, we see vice versa. To give another example, we have seen that at least in other fibrosis, in other organs, these fibrosis may also decrease. So perhaps we have uh, better outcomes associated with uh, the treatment of these antifibrotic drugs. Great. So there's lots more to learn, I guess. Yeah, yeah um, a lot of more to learn. Yeah. Another question, um, uh, perhaps a final question, almost. When major surgery is undertaken to treat comorbidities, do these operations themselves present a major risk to the further development of pulmonary fibrosis? What's the actual mechanism, is it? I mean, you talk Very about exacerbation. So, so let's first speak about detrimental and then about positive outcomes of surgery. So the detrimental outcomes, for instance, surgery on the lungs. So if you're suffering from lung cancer, let's say you're on your left side, and then surgery is indicated, what the anesthesiologist does is that because the surgeon has to work on your left lung, he only incubates your right lung. He uses a lot of pressure and a lot of oxygen. So he uses more pressure than he would normally or you would normally use uh, when you're breathing on yourself. So while the surgeon is working here, there's a lot of oxygen and a lot of pressure on your lungs, which is already affected by IPF. And that pressure then gives pressure on your fibrotic scarring, and that may induce acute exacerbation. And we have seen this, and that is one of the problems with lung cancer and IPF. We are seeing this with a very high risk. That can also happen in other um, surgical procedures, including abdominal uh, surgeries. That is why, if possible, we recommend uh, having a kind of a local anesthesia. But there's also other procedures which at least might be helpful. And this is again with regards to reflex disease. There was again Ganesh Regu who said, well, after I discussed a little bit with him, so my, my point was always, if you're using PPI, you're not decreasing reflux, you're only decreasing the, gas, uh, the acidic compound. And he said, well, yes, one of the points how you could stop mitral restorations is that you do surgery on the stomach. That is called what we call fund duplication. And he has performed a very nice try together with other colleagues from the US. And what they did is they performed surgery on patients who had a severe IPF and a severe reflux disease, and then they performed fund duplication, and then have seen in a very small but very nice trial that those people who had received that surgery had a better further course of IPF than those who have not received it. So in general, our surgery, especially on the lung, may have negative outcomes, but there might be 
at least some application may have a positive outcome, but the data are still not good enough. Great. Thank you very much. A, a final question on um, prognosis. You know, when IPF patients are told, given their diagnosis, they're often told, at least in the UK, that they've got three to five years to live. Now, we know that hopefully with antifibrotics may extend life a little bit, and we're hoping that's getting better. When a person with CHP, your chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, RA, ILD, um, you're one of the other scler scleroderma, ILD, what's the prognosis for those? Is it similar? This is a very good question. This is a question um, which is it's not easy to tell. So um, let's speak a little bit about systemic sclerosis. There's very nice data coming from Anna Maria Hoffman Roll uh, from Norway. So she looked into a cohort of patients with systemic sclerosis, and what she has seen is once interstitial lung disease. Uh, once systemic sclerosis, sorry, um, affects the lungs in terms of ILD, whatever the initial lung function is, then outcomes are uh, severely um, impacted. If you have a more or less preserved lung function, then your prognosis is much better, but the more uh, progressed and the more impaired the lung function, the less the survival rate is. But it is much better than an IPF. For rheumatoid arthritis ILD, just to give you another example, there is some people who have the same outcome as an IPF and there's other who have a better one. And we think that one of the very important points is those who develop progressive fibrosis, meaning they have an IPF-like type, subtype of rheumatoid arthritis, they have a very similar outcome. And we have seen this in very others. But currently, we don't have good data. That is one of the points, Steve, where you're involved. That is why we are currently investigating together with other colleagues, rheumatoid arthritis, ILD, uh, to understand and learn more about this. Okay, yeah, we've got some of those colleagues who are on the call tonight, I know, as well, here in the lecture. Good, yeah. um, good. so finally, Michael, I mean, I think we're it's great to say that um, nintendinib has been approved by the Federal Drug Administration in the USA and the European Medicines Agency in Europe for use um, for these other fibrotic ILDs that we've been talking about this evening. So there's hope, I think in Holland, they're prescribing already. Um, <clears throat> for the UK um, people here today on the call, on the lecture, um, the process has started. NICE is considering started its uh, appraisal of nintendinib for um, progressive uh, fibrotic ILD. <clears throat> Um, I, I Action for pulmonary fibrosis has made a, a significant submission to the consultation. There will be meetings this year, and we hope there will be a decision, and we hope it will be a favourable decision uh, by September. So fingers crossed for all those people who are suffering with PFILD that there may be access to antifibrotic medicines quite soon. Another question that came on the chat was about um, scleroderma ILD. What's the situation with that, is that approved now in tetanib for scleroderma ILD? Good question. So that would have been a bit over complicated to, to include that in the PF ILD. Mm -hmm. So systemic sclerosis ILD, I think, was very nicely investigated also with regards to the use of nintendinib. That was the so-called census trial. Mm -hmm. And what they found there was, again, very similar to what I have shown you for the PF ILD, a little bit uh, less decrease there. but. Uh, the, the relative decline, or if you compare, was very similar, that you have less decline if you're suffering from SSC-related lung fibrosis once you take an antenna. And that was approved even before PFILD by FDA and EMA. And it is available in Germany for both indications. So I can treat SSC-ILD patients with antenna, but also PFILD patients. And I think the same discussion is in other countries. Some countries already can prescribe it. And uh, at least to my knowledge, it is dis or discussed currently also in the UK or as, as one of the trucks which you may use uh, once you're affected by SSC ILD. Yeah, it's actually so a lot of things going on. Yeah, in the UK, it's with part of the same appraisal going on now. They're looking at SS ILD as well as the other PF ILDs um, to see if we they will agree to it being used. But that's great. Well, Michael, it's been a wonderful evening. I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of all of us um, for your excellent talk and for, for stimulating a great discussion. There are a number of questions that we, we couldn't get to, so we will ask you if you are able to, to um, give written answers to those.
I mean, this is a really fantastic contribution to our webinar series, and we're we're really grateful. Thanks especially to um, all of you who asked questions, and especially to the Greek participants um, for their you know, very energetic questioning tonight. Many of the questions came from Greece through translation, which is a great first. You know, we, we, we've tended to do subtitles afterwards rather than simultaneous translation. And it's great to see that simultaneous translation has worked so well. Um, we had, I think, over 140 people here with us tonight, which is, which is amazing. We hope you all enjoyed the evening and you'll come to future events. Keep an eye on our website for those. Finally, I would like to thank the EU IPFF Secretariat team, Jan, um, Jan, uh, Samantha, <coughs> and Alba for their hard work in, in putting this together tonight. These things aren't easy to launch and they do it so well and so seamlessly that I'm, we're really, really very pleased. We recorded the session tonight. It'll be posted on our website. So if you want to, you can view it all again before you go to bed. Maybe not that quickly, possibly tomorrow. Um, so many thanks, Michael, again. Um, pity you couldn't play your trumpet tonight, but maybe next time. Um, and uh, many thanks to everybody for coming and good night. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Take care, stay safe, and look forward to hopefully to meet you all in person very soon again. Thank great. you very much. Thank you, Michael. Cheers.